So hello, today we have uh, Dr. Angela Tabiri with us. Uh, she's a female mathematician from Ghana. Uh, she's now working at the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences as a Google AI postdoctoral fellow. Uh, before this, she did her PhD from uh, University of Glasgow uh, in algebra. And uh, before that, she was uh, a diploma student at ICTP in Trieste and uh, before that, she was in Ghana doing her master's in business and mathematics. Um, so welcome, Angela. Thank you very much for giving your time. Okay, thank you, Manjo. <laughs> um, so uh, since uh, we started like to list uh, all of your different institutes that you have studied in, so uh, how did this happen? Like how, what was the chronology behind uh, starting mathematics and how did you end up uh, at Ames Ghana now as a, as a postdoctoral fellow? Okay, so I'll, I'll start from between high school and university, right? Because that's where you make the big decisions. So in high school, my, my majors were in accounting and business management, so more towards um, the business school. And I wanted to be a chartered accountant. So in my class, almost everyone wanted to be a chartered accountant. That was what my sisters also did that. So that was what I aspired to be. Then going to the university, I didn't quite get into the business school. <laughs> I got my second choice, which was mathematics, economics, and other subjects. So I just took it, right? I don't want to stay at home. So it was at the university that I realized, okay, I was good at math in the secondary school, but you know, growing up, you don't see math as a career. So I didn't really think of it. Thought, I thought of it as something I was good at. So in first year, you struggle a little, but afterwards I realized, okay, Math was so cool, right? It's not cool because you just understand everything. <laughs> you have to work for a while before you understand it. And it was so much joy like, to finally understand something. It could be after weeks or hours, but it gave so much fulfillment. So that was when I realized, okay, I, I like math, right? But I was still not convinced. So it was after I did my master's and maybe at ICTP that I realized, okay, so maybe a, a PhD in mathematics would be good. Because um, yeah, there was so much I could learn and I could enjoy it at the same time. Yeah, so yeah, so that was how I found my way to Ames, then to uh, to Glasgow, then back to Ames again. Yeah. Um, so could you like tell something about Ames because it seems to be a very unique concept uh, that you have. Uh, yeah. So a little bit about Ames and how is the environment in Ames? Okay, so Ames is. Um, it's a network of Pan-African centers across Africa. We, uh, we believe that the next Einstein will come from Africa. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy dream, but we believe the next Einstein will come from Africa. So we've set up centers across Africa to train um, graduates in mathematics um, with lecturers from top universities. So the lecturers come from, from abroad or locally, but they are not full-time, right? They come for three weeks. They teach a whole semester in three weeks, right? And the aim is that in a number of years, we want to be leading scientific research across Africa because we are Africans born here and we lived here, we understand our problems. So with the mathematical tools that we develop, we'll be able to solve problems in our society. So that's the, the broader aim of AIMS, of AIMS. So yeah, so I came to AIMS first because it was a, it's a scholarship program. So you don't have to pay for it and you earn your master's from there. You get to meet all these top people. So that was why I came to AIMS. And now after my PhD, I was also looking for opportunities. You know, it's hard to get to the universities and all the bureaucracies and AIMS gave me an offer for a postdoc here. So yeah, it's great to be back, right? To support your own, to, to see you as a, a success story that you came here, you went. And also to see you coming back, right? Because very often we go and we stay abroad, but coming back to AIMS here to to support the vision again, yeah. So that's roughly how I left Ames and come back at Ames, yeah. And what Ames stands for, yeah. So uh, as you mentioned that uh, you expect the next Einstein to be from Africa and there is also a next Einstein initiative from Ames, right? Yes, yes, so. What, what is this about? Can you tell, like how, how does it work? Yeah, so, okay, so Ames has these master's programs, right? But we also believe there are other ways we can find the next Einstein, not, the next Einstein might not study at Ames, right, but other initiatives like the, so we have a forum called the Next Einstein Forum, which brings 
us scientists from all across Africa to brainstorm and do all that. So that's also one way of bringing all the different people who are working across together. So that's just one aspect of it, but there are different projects under this so that not just the, the MSc graduates, but other Africans who are working in different sectors can feed into this, um, this whole um, initiative, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, before preparing for this uh, conversation, I looked at some of the interviews that you have given before. And uh, in one of them, you say that uh, there was one female uh, professor at Ames uh, who wrote a recommendation letter for you. So growing up, uh, did you feel that there was like a gender imbalance in, in the education sector that you were pursuing in? Uh, and how does that, uh, so how does that reflect uh, in, in terms of AIMS, how it is now? So is there gender balance now or is it this? Okay, so I'll start from the university. I went to a girls school for secondary school. So <laughs> there, was, there was nothing like that here. So it was at the university that I realized. So when you begin, the numbers are quite balanced, but as you go ahead, people, do. so how it works, uh, I was a social science student. So you'd have a number of major um, courses, you drop them as you go ahead, right? But, so by the time you get to your final year, there are very few people. So in, in my final year, we were 100 students, only 10 of us were females, okay? Yeah, I, I guess one reason would be in the math department, uh, okay, we had two female lecturers, okay? Um, only one with a PhD, she was the head of department. So I think when you come to a department and you don't have a female teaching you or you don't see a lot of females around you, you feel, okay, this is not for me. So, but for me, the head of department, when she taught us a course, um, so one thing I liked was she knew her students, right? So for me, yeah, I was just doing maths because I liked it, but, and because in first year, the class sizes are very big and some courses about 500 students. So there's no way the lecturer will know everyone. And when you get to level 300 and 400, it becomes more. And I realize when she brings assignments to class, she will mention your name and she will give you your script, right? So I went, okay, she knows us. Then when we were going to final year, um, she, she tried to convince us to, to, to major in mathematics because she, she felt we were good at it and there could be a few China, but we didn't, yeah, back then I didn't really know what you could do with it, right? So for me, she she really inspired me. And, she, and just like you said, um, when I was going to Ames and also even for my PhD, she wrote recommendations for me. So yeah, this was one female who, who was uh, maybe the only one among a number of males, but she supported a lot of women. But yeah, you don't see a lot of balance in the classroom and also in terms of the faculty. But at AIMS, so AIMS has a, a policy that uh, we want about 30% of the students to be females. So every year when admissions are, uh, are being done, there's a conscious effort to make sure that we get this percentage of females here. So um, even in my year and even currently, there are 30 percent of the, at least 30% of the of the students and females, so which is I think great. You know, sometimes people say that, yeah, that currently some of the students, female students, still they are here because of the quota, or maybe that's how some of the guys make them feel. But hey, we didn't, we don't have similar opportunities growing up, right? Sometimes if you grow up in in a home where there's a, you are you have a brother. Okay, I didn't have brothers, so <laughs> equal opportunities for us. But sometimes. We give more opportunities to the boys to go to maybe private schools and all that but the ladies so there are a lot of imbalances right but if we have gone through all these in imbalances and we've gotten here it's not as if we come here with a third class no we come here with a good second class upper, but not a first class so the fact that i've made it with all these challenges you should give me a chance, right? So that when I come here, I can also do it. So yeah, so that's that's how it works at AIMS. There's a quota here and we make a conscious effort to to, to pick females. Yeah. So, so it's uh, getting a bit better, would you say now? That there's time, there's um, so you see, you see, it keeps on going down as you go ahead, right? Mm -hmm. So in primary school in Ghana, there are more females than males. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, not just in primary, junior secondary school. But as you go ahead, you know, a lot of reasons come into factor, um, people, some women have to go and work or teenage pregnancy, so many things come into, into play. So the numbers keep dropping, right? So now AIMS has 
everything else. But how many of them will go into if so it depends on how you measure it. Are we going to measure it in terms of women in academic jobs? So how many of them will even get PhDs afterwards? And how many of them will continue with postdocs or even have a career in, in STEM? So it depends on how you are measuring it. Are we measuring it based on how many successful PhDs we have or just how many women who graduate? In terms of women who graduate, at least 30%. Are. But what happens afterwards? Some go into entrepreneurship, some go into yeah, other, other places. So it depends on how you are measuring it. If you are measuring it with a PhD, then I would say not, of course, not everyone will go into a PhD, and so quite a few of them. So um, in my year group, um, a number of us are nearing uh, um, the end of the PhDs, but yeah, I think, yeah, I think I'm the only female who is done, done. Someone, one of my friends, she has finished, but I think she's now left to defend. Some are still PhDs, so yeah, the curve is, is different for, for us, right? Sometimes you take a break and all that, so yeah. So, so um, uh, probably like all of these factors was the motivation for starting the film Africa Maths uh, YouTube and Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you want me to blow up, talk about it? Yeah. Could, you, could you say a bit how this came about and uh, what you were doing in general and what do you see it doing in the future a bit? Yeah. Yeah, so um, so we were all at ICTP, right? At ICTP, you realized... And also, and also, I should mention that uh, you are known as the Maths Queen of Kana. Uh, <laughs> yes, in a way. <laughs> so, um, so after ICTP, I realized, okay, this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to do maths, right? But I was looking for female mentors who had done similar things like me online. I couldn't find some. So I would search, okay, female African mathematicians and... You see some, but you don't see a strong presence of them. So at, at Glasgow, I realized, okay, I could do something. I used to do community outreach, but I was no longer in Ghana, so I can't be physically there. But I realized, I don't know about how you got used to social media, but it was for me in Glasgow that I realized, okay, you could do a lot with social media, right? Twitter, Facebook, and all that. You could reach a, a wide audience. So I remember it was my... It was my 28th birthday, so I, I had a party, and there I, I launched this whole idea because I had friends there, and I told them, okay, enough of seeing um, all the red carpets. It's great to see all the beautiful clothes on the red carpets and all that, but we also want to give an alternative to young girls that you could aspire to be a mathematician, right? So that was when I, I started this whole hash, hashtag of hashtag mass queen, hashtag femma freak mass. So femma freak mass, so fem means female, Afrik means African, then mass means mathematicians. So I started this whole thing. So I set up social media pages, right? But how, what was the way forward? The way forward was to interview female African mathematicians that I meet. So if I go to a conference, if I'm at Glasgow and I see someone, then I, okay, I interview them, not just because they are females, with African origin, but also because they are doing diverse things. So I've interviewed someone who has a maths degree who is now working with Mozilla. So she's doing internet security stuff. Someone who is working with tuberculosis, someone who is working in um, epidemiology. So they, they are all do, doing different things. So that a young person, so for example, I go to YouTube, um, Facebook, and I see a, um, analysis, uh, was it analytics. You see people from all over watching your videos, right? You want a young girl in, JLC, Democratic Republic of Congo, to see it and say, oh, okay, so I can aspire to do this, I can aspire to do this. That was mainly the, that was the driving force of it, to, to put a lot of female mentors out there, so that a university student who, who doesn't see a female faculty will see this on Facebook and say, okay, I can do a PhD in mathematics, someone somewhere can see. So that was the main idea, using social media, but now we are also going to the ground level. So that's mainly it. And it's, it seems to be going up. So sometimes I meet people and like, I don't even know them. And they're like, oh, hashtag mask queen. Like the, the, the hashtag has really, it really goes far, which is great, which means you're making an impact, right? All the noise you're making on social media, people see, yes. Yeah. So, so, so you mentioned that you are now doing groundwork. What kind of groundwork? Yeah, so um, we believe that um, people lose interest in mass at a young age, mm -hmm. right? So. If you want to get them, you have to get them very young. Of course, very, very young will be for crash and all that, but now we want to start from the junior high school level. 
So I have a team of people which I'm very grateful. And for. and high school in Ghana is from which years to years? Which years? Um, let's say twelve to fourteen. So we have two levels. So we have junior high school before senior high school. Okay. So after the first three years, that's junior high school. You write um and exams and national exams. Mm -hmm which shows whether you should go to senior high school, right? which is it's a big deal because that's what determines. And, and this is the government exam for, for yes, which exactly. you have scholarships, right? Exactly. Yes. And you know, uh, I don't know if you know, but in Ghana now we have free secondary education. It wasn't the same when I was, when I was in that level. So now um, poverty is not a barrier, right? All you need to do is to pass your exams and you can study anyway. You don't pay anything. And if, for us, most secondary schools is broadened. So we are fed and everything. So I decided, okay, how can I support the young people? So I've grown up in deprived areas before, so I know how it feels like. So I said, okay, I can't do this on my own. I used to do this, but I can't impact just on my own. So I believe a great thing to do is to train young other people to do it. So now I have four volunteers. We used to go to a community school on Sundays in the afternoons. To, to teach them mathematics. And these were students that their school felt they were below average. They weren't the standard students, so they felt they were dragging everyone back. So I said, okay, we take them and <laughs> teach them math. And you could see that we started in November last year, you could see the joy in them that they had someone dedicated to them. So we tried to reduce the teacher to student ratio. So maybe one, teacher to two or three students so that you could have a lot of time for them. So we started this in November and from time to time we took their feedback and they, they, they could see their confidence increasing, right? Um, they understanding things better because someone will, will break it down to their level. And just that because of the, the crisis, the corona, so we, we, we no longer can see them personally. Then we took it, now we've taken it online. So I don't know how they are, engaging with the online classes, but I feel that's a little way of not just reaching out to them, but also reaching out to the wider community because um, people watch us from all across and we, yeah, so we do the same lessons, but now online and people can send in their comments and all. So that's our way of um, reaching out at a young age because you know, okay, I don't know, but, um, but I don't know if you know, but at the, um, at this level, junior high school level, where they take this exam, that's when they choose whether to, they are going to major in science, whether they are going to major in agri, whether they are going to major in business and all that. So if someone's mass is weak, then they can no longer do science. If their mass is weak, they cannot do business or other courses. Okay. So we want to strengthen their mass, their mass so that if I want to be an astronaut, I can dream of, I can get into science and do that. And the, Failure in mass won't prevent me from getting there. So that's what we are doing now. Um, and I hope uh, results come out of it, yeah. So, so uh, who, who, from where do you get your funding? For, for this work? <laughs> yeah, so funding, personally, I, I fund it myself. So I pay the volunteers, their transport, we get some refreshments, yeah. But I think that's my little way, you know, sometimes you have to start something on your own before sure. people believe in your dream, right? So, yeah, that's how I, I, I think I'm, I'm gradually getting people who see it to be great. So hopefully people will buy into the idea. So I remember one of my professors asked me this, I was visiting um, last January and she said, oh, okay, if you want a million dollar job, what would you do? And then I told her about this. So gradually people are getting to know about it and hopefully get funded <laughs> okay um, so among all of these works so do you feel uh, like is it difficult to do mathematics uh, communication for young students uh, especially girls or it's like any other subject that you would probably teach at school um come again sorry um so what i mean is uh, is there any particular difficulty that you face while communicating mathematics to the young students so I think the challenge is to find motivations for them. So um, one thing I like, um, one feature of a great teacher is that you motivate your students. You don't just teach them this, take this, but you have to tell them why they should take this. So, and our motivation should come from our environment, right? So I don't use examples of 
apples when they don't see apples here. Yeah. <laughs> I want to use a local fruit, mangoes or something. So yes, yeah, that's a challenge mainly because you have to really think through before you find something that they can relate to and and bring it to them in the lessons. And for me, that's the, the biggest challenge, trying to find examples that they can relate to. Yeah. So if you are talking about, I don't want to use, I can't use trains, for example, see, because I have, I have to use um, truck roads and local transportation. So if I want to talk about wet problems, I'll use that because that's what they probably took in the morning and they could relate to it. And that needs a lot of time and attention to, to really develop. So that's mainly the challenge. But every time I think, yeah, we are gradually getting some examples, which from time to time we will build on. And and what can be done more to get more engagement from young girls towards uh, science and mathematics or engineering or medicine? Yeah, I, I think it's more of seeing people doing stuff. Or it's more of getting to them, okay, getting to them in the classroom. So it could be Friday afternoons uh, uh, is for mass, so you have people coming to play games with them. It could be... Um, science festival so you go to the mall and you see all these people doing i think the more people see things the more they embrace it right because now people see it as very far but if you have people constantly coming to them in their face either in class um in the on the streets or even on, on tv or on social media and they go they say, oh okay this example this person is talking about this using this basic example then they will that barrier will be taken. So I think it's more getting more ambassadors, which is something I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to scale with. Now we have four people working on this, right? But we are getting requests from people, how can I join, how can I do this? So if we can get more people, then it means that we are not only going to be working with this school, we can work with different schools. We could get university um, undergrad. I don't know if you know of the STEM ambassador program in the UK. So the, the UK, um, you register, they do your PVG, of course, to be sure you, you are okay to work with children. And you go to schools. I remember doing one with uh, P3 students and you talk about, you do very basic things with them. So they have, even, even professionals even join the, the program. And so you have an engineer coming to class, coming to talk to you and all that. So that the young person is, okay, I can aspire to be this. I can, I can aspire to do For me, that's, the bigger picture, right? To have a more structured program like this where people can get some certificates to be ambassadors and they can go into schools to inspire young, young ones. It's more of seeing it because I saw my head of department in the, in the university was female and I could dream to be it. So if someone could see, so I tell the young people I teach that they are privileged to see someone who has done this at a young age. I didn't see this, so I didn't dream of this until I got to the university. But if they can make their choices now, it will guide them as they go ahead. And uh, you were probably seen as one of these uh, spokesperson or ambassadors for the young girls, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm your mom, please. I think, yeah, I think. Not only young, not only young girls, probably also for young boys. <laughs> Sure, sure. I think, you see, we've been quiet for so long, right? The fact that you do math doesn't mean you shouldn't be out there, right? They see mathematicians as, yeah, we, we are crazy, we have crazy hair, we dress crazy and all that, but we also have to show them that, no, it's not just that, but we work, I can work crazy, but I'm a normal person, right? So, yeah, I think it's good to be out there and be the voice, right? Be the voice for for, for the young ones so that they know that, okay, you are not alone because someone could be aspiring to be a mathematician, but because you don't see mathematicians out there doing other stuff, you know, okay, maybe it's not the right choice, but when they see you and they see how prospect you are, it helps. And, and is there like some sort of uh, maths phobia among the students in Ghana? Of course, yes. Yeah. So in, in most schools, I think it, for us, um, I'll talk about Ghana because um, that's where I've, I've lived and that's where I understand. In Ghana, I don't know about in India, but I know in the UK, for instance, when teachers are being selected to go into teacher training, they choose the best to, in, before you even get into uh, teacher training, if you want to be a science or math teacher, you have to have very strong um, 
very strong degrees and all that. So, and the the level of um, of education training is really high, but in Ghana is different. So, some people who go into teacher training are people who probably didn't get their first choice. So probably they wanted to go to the university or other places. So because they didn't get there, they go into teacher training. So they go there, maybe not even being confident on themselves, um, not really understanding things properly. So these are the people who are going to train young people. Right? So sometimes they are not motivated enough. Um, um, maybe they don't think of creative ways of teaching and all that. So. Yeah, so that's the challenge because at the basic level, the people who are influencing these students are not people who really appreciate their subjects. So they end up scaring students here. They tell you class is difficult. We can't make it. And, it, and they even sometimes tell the students. So I told you about the students we teach, right? That they were the, in the bottom of the class. So there are students who already feel condemned because their teacher would have told them in the face that, yeah, you are the only way to pass the exams, you are failure and all that, which is wrong, right? In, in our society, of course, currently there aren't any structures to, to penalize teachers who do this, right? Because I feel it's not right for you to tell me that I'm a failure or I can't do this, right? You also to encourage me and find ways of supporting me. So for us, the challenge is mainly teachers pushing students off that their yeah, math is difficult, you are not good enough and all that, but if we can support students because I believe we all have different needs, right? I can go to class and understand everything, but someone might not be able to. So if we can find ways of supporting them, then this whole phobia will, will, will not be as high at, as it is now because as, as it is now, most people, if even for second years, most people fail their exams and they have to take it over and over again before they go to university. But if at a young age, they realize, oh, okay, um, I'm teaching fractions and I use um, maybe mangoes, me dividing it, something that they can relate to, something that they can relate to. Then you realize, oh, okay, math is not that difficult. It's something I see around me and something that I can actually usually use. So, yeah, I think, yeah, the, the core is teachers, then it goes up to people saying negative things to students. Yeah. And, um... So from after talking to you, I think that uh, the problems that you face is uh, similar to the problems that we have back at home in India. Um, but probably it's a bit different with countries like UK, right? Would you say that yeah. the, system and the system in UK is probably a bit different? Yeah. yeah. Also, it is not very fair to compare because, uh, as yeah. you know, like uh, the, the spending on education is very low in some countries compared to yeah. some others. So, for instance, in India, it is very low. Uh, I'm not sure about Ghana, but I would assume that it is not very really yeah. high. Yeah, maybe I wasn't comparing, right? Because, of course, in the UK, you have maybe more learned people teaching in primary schools and all that. So, yeah, but we can learn from it, right? Why do they choose this? Because they know you get people from the right, from the young age. So, if you don't have a strong person teaching you from the young age, then you lose them. Uh, so now let, let us come to your other aspect of your work, that is your research. Uh, okay. So could you, could you say very briefly about, about what you did in your PhD? Uh, yeah, so the, the title of my PhD thesis was Quantum Group Actions on Brain Caps. Yeah. It is very abstract, right? But it's all about classifying curves. So, okay, so I'll try to explain it in, in a short <laughs> In a few sentences. So if you take the, the football, okay, um, every point on it looks the same because it's curved the same everywhere. So we say it's homogeneous, okay. But if you take the the alpha symbol, okay, or which is given by some equation, y squared equal to x squared plus x cubed, you, you, you realize that at the point where the two lines meet is is different because if you take that point out, you have like different ways of going by. If you take another point out, it's different, right? So it's a singular, a singular point. Okay? So it can't be homogeneous because that point is different from the others. So, um, so that it is somehow homogeneous, somehow in the sense that the quantum comes from you putting a non-commutative structure on it. So 
my PhD uh, was trying to classify all pain curves which are found to homogeneous places. Uh, we made some progress. We we've got a class of curves which are which are of a certain form. If we have it to be of a certain form, then we we get like a quantum linear space, but we have a conjecture. We believe it holds in general, but we were not able to prove it. So that was for the PhD. And then you know how PhD projects go, you get tired of them. So <laughs> you leave them. So who is the we that you mentioned that we have a conjecture? So who are the ah, yeah, so um so I have two papers, one published, the other yet to be. So one is with Uli Kramer, who was my supervisor in Glasgow before he moved. So he moved to Germany. And when he moved, I, ch <clears throat> I changed supervisors to Ken Brown. Ken Brown is in Glasgow. So yeah. So the conjecture is with Uli. Yes, the conjecture is with Uli. Yeah. And, and was it difficult when you changed your supervisor in between? Yeah. So I feel I lost maybe six months of my PhD because Kenny didn't know about the projects. So I had to fill him in on everything. And that was even after we got our first result. So he had to now get to understand it and continue from there. But yeah, I think there's always a trade-off, right? You either move to another country, another culture, or you, you change. Yeah, so yeah. But it all worked out well. You, you learn from two great people and how everyone works is differently. So I'm happy I, I, I learned from all. I from both of them. And and you are still continuing the same kind of work uh, in your postdoc now, or you are shifting to some other area? Yeah, so my postdoc. <laughs> so um, when I started, I was working on a project with um, five other women in math. So it was um, more category theory stuff, but also algebra. So it's um, group theoretical fusion category. So it's trying to do all these puff algebra, quantum stuff, but using categorical stuff. So yeah, it's not quite like my PhD. That was what I did, which we are done with. But currently, I'm working on quantum two groups, which is kind of similar to what I did, but also on a higher level. So yeah, I think it's nice. I do. I want to learn new stuff. So that's why I'm, I'm not directly working on my PhD stuff. I'm trying to see what, what else is out there because I'm not sure what I want to do, so I want to explore and see where my interest would be. And hopefully, I'll go with one of them. Yeah. So my my, it, they are all quantum quantum stuff, but with different approaches. You know, with different approaches. So you are also teaching at the moment, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So. And uh, so, how do you like it? And what courses do you teach usually? Yeah, so teaching. So I think teaching is a great way to escape from research. I don't know how you find research, but sometimes I find it boring and lonely. So it's a nice way to, you know, when you're doing your research, sometimes things don't work, right? Maybe most of the time, so you are really down. But when you go to class, you're the expert there, right? <laughs> most, sometimes the students know better than you, but most of the time you are the one who is leading it and all that so it gives you some confidence to yeah to show up a little <laughs> in a way so um so at aims uh, part of my post office to teach so last september i taught a course of linear algebra so the students have different backgrounds so it's great it's um it's more of a basic skill for them that they learn about maps and vectors and all that so i taught that for for a month then Ames also has a machine intelligence program. So that's where the, the Google AI comes in. So that's sort of my Facebook and Google. So there I teach mathematics for machine learning, which for me in the, the first place, I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure I could teach it right? because I'm more abstract. I remember the first day I went to class, you know how these tech people look at me like, who is this person? I'm not a big name in their field, right? They do not expect me to. And I'm, I'm young, I'm a female, so yeah, yeah, okay, what's he coming to do? But for me, I saw it as a challenge because you can be doing pure math, but how are you going to fund your research, right? <laughs> Where would you get money for your postdoc and all that? So if money is coming from here and it's not coming for the coming sake, it's coming because the mathematics, you know, is important. So it was great to, to teach math for, as a tool for machine learning and all that. 
yeah, and also to find another approach of teaching. So I thought, so the, my class in machine learning is linear algebra, multivariate calculus, and principal component analysis. Okay. So I thought linear algebra for the mathematical science thing, by using the rigorous way, vector space, you write all your axioms and all that, right? But now you are in front of these uh, computer people, and they don't, they, they won't listen to you if you come with axioms, right? So you have to find ways. Okay, vectors, you have to think of them as a list of attributes. You try to think of them as arrows, moving them in space. And for me, it gave me a new approach, a new approach where I could think of math in their eyes and, and also teachers. So that was what I thought. So I taught them in Rwanda and Ghana. We have the, the two programs there. And I also teach at the University of Ghana. So I have a part-time job. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the University of Ghana. So I teach a course in module theory. You know, okay. final yesterday. So that, yeah. that must be more enjoyable then for you. Come again? That must be more enjoyable for you. Yeah, then? yeah. Because that was where I was, right? So I remember like he stepped over, like, okay, I was once a student in my lecture. <laughs> and seeing the look on the students, you're trying to get them to work. Yeah, so I like I like teaching, but I think if you also want to go up the ladder, you also have to add some research to it, right? It's not just about teaching. It depends, yeah. So yeah, it's good to have both. I'm happy I have both experiences that I can do research and also take a break and teach and Try to balance both. Yeah, so that's roughly what I teach. So, so you're enjoying your position at the moment? At, at AIMS? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think the postdoc is uh, it's a nice break from... Yeah. Sometimes it's nice because you are doing your own stuff, right? But sometimes it's lonely because you don't have a supervisor on your neck every week <laughs> asking <laughs> for meetings and all that. So, yeah, I think I'm... Um, Maybe seven months into it, so okay. yeah, trying to find my feet, but I think it's it's okay. Maybe unless very soon when the the emails come, how many publications do you have? Then you realize, okay, <laughs> yeah. But I think it's gradually, right? You know, going baby steps till we get there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so what other initiatives would you like to take in the future apart from what we have discussed so far? Um, so I don't know if you've heard about Science Slam. Yes, yes, I have. And also I've seen your, your very, very nice video. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just like you said, right, you have to communicate mathematics or science to an average person, to a lay person. So after participating in it in Glasgow, I decided to bring it to Ghana because um, we don't see a lot of it because people see math to be all the abstract or science. So we want to demystify it. So I remember last year, when, was it last year? No, okay, it's 2020, <laughs> two years ago. Uh, my supervisor said, no, it was just last year. Yeah, it was last year. Yeah, a lot happened last year, right? I graduated and I did it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I came with my supervisor last year. It was January to February. So he was teaching a course at AIMS Ghana and I decided to organize one, um, a science lab. We had just four weeks for them, but because they had seen my video, they were all excited about it. They wanted to participate. So we took them through training because science communication is not all about you having your topic, right? You have to break it down to make it fun and engaging. So we had an event that was Ames Ghana students who spoke. So it was mainly mathematics stuff, but it was great. Um, the videos are on YouTube. Um, the, the winners talked about the Diophantine equation. Um, they, they talked about uh, if you have a wedding, it was interesting piece and you have these jars and you want to find this lit, lit. So it was interesting to see it. So um, this year I was trying to organize one, but I was, I am, but you know, COVID came in and now we have to improvise. Maybe we have to do it online or something. So that's something going forward. I want to do more of science communication. So part of my job at AIMS is also for science communication because as an institute, the market human should understand why it's important for government to fund AIMS. It shouldn't just be because we want to do our equations. They have to relate to it. So that's something I want to take higher. Maybe train. Maybe I'll go and do another master's. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, but that's going forward. I want to do more science communication. And yeah, apart from the research and the thermal stuff, I want to do more science communication. 
Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. If I have time, maybe do some fashion designing. <laughs> <laughs> Have some fabrics there, maybe. Too, I remember you always had a very nice sense of fashion. So all of your clothes. yeah, I saw some of my clothes. I saw some of my clothes. So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I have a sewing machine in Glasgow. When I was leaving, I made clothes for friends. Maybe I'll do a fashion show for them. <laughs> the, a mat inspired fashion show by the Mats Queen. It would be very nice. <laughs> they are basic. They are basic stuff but i think it's, it's a nice way to get away from work but i think mathematics features i remember it would be interesting to see how um, you know when you are you are um, you are sewing something you are sewing something in two dimensions for a three-dimensional person right so how do you take care of all these to make sure things fit so yeah it's interesting maybe i'll maybe i'll take a course in this stuff yeah my interest changed but yeah, for now I'm doing the <laughs> post drug, but if I have time, I'll do I'll do some fashion designing. Yeah. <laughs> I'll design something for you. <laughs> yes, yes, it would be very nice, yeah. Um so uh is there any like sort of a, a single message that you want to give to young students of mathematics, young girls especially? Yeah, so I have three words um which lately I've been talking so much about. So it's dream believe take action okay so after that we dream so as a young person i grew up in a community where i don't remember seeing a doctor yeah it was all the social vices you, you think of it was it was very deprived community but i had a dream okay i i i believed i could go beyond my surrounding the fact that i see this doesn't mean i have to stay in this so um, I'll tell them that um, don't let your surroundings define your dreams, okay? Dream as big as you can. I told the, the young people that I ha haven't seen any Ghanaian going to space, right? I want to see them aspire to be the first Ghanaian astronauts, first Ghanaian to go to space. So dream, um, is, I think that's what drives you because if you don't have a dream, then you can just be mediocre. But if you have a dream, it really drives you. Then believe in your dream, okay? So can have a dream, right? But yeah, it could just be yeah, a fantasy. But if you believe in it, you get other people to believe in it. So the people who believe in it will be your mentors who are going to write recommendations for you, your mentors who are going to guide you and all that. So have a dream, but also believe in it. Then finally take action, okay? So you can have a dream, you believe in it, but you have to work towards it, right? In order to be a mathematician, you have to have a degree in mathematics, you have to have a master's degree, and all of that is a lot of hard work and, yeah, so the support of people, okay? So dream, believe, but also work towards it, okay? Gradually, but you get there. So dream, believe, take action. Okay, very, very nice message. <laughs> Not only for young people, but for everyone, I think. Yeah, because personally, I'm at this stage, like you were asking me what I want to do. Now I feel PhD is done, right? Yeah. I want to do something else. Yeah, I'm also dreaming now <laughs> of what, what next, what's the next big thing. Yeah, so yeah, it's for everyone, not just for children. Yeah. And, and you see yourself uh, staying in Ghana in the future, in the long term? Yeah, so my, my, my passion has always been about Ghana. So if, even if I have to travel would be to train because it's very hard to find um, places to learn. So for instance, I was thinking about science communication. I don't think there's a university here that gives a master's or training in it. So if I want to train, it would be to train abroad and come back. For me, I see Ghana as a place of opportunities. Like any time I walk around, ideas just come in like, I can do this, I can do that. So yeah, my long-term goal is to stay here and, and build something, right? Yeah, I want to, to to see something spring out from all these crazy stuff I've been doing because I'm at ease because I found that Neil Turok dream, dreamt of something and he's created, created this whole environment for us. So I also want to create something for the young people in our community so that they can have something to hold on to. So yeah, Ghana is my place. So if anytime you want to come here, yeah, just, just let me know. <laughs> yeah, just start it again. <laughs> So it sounds it sounds wonderful your ideas and your passion for your work. Thank you very much for having this conversation with us. Okay.
and not only this but thank you very much for inspiring so many young girls from ghana and i am sure with this interview also in i get to india <laughs> thank you so yeah. much okay thank you bye, bye.